Okay, tonight I'm going to talk about what is called the modern general of the Civil War participating in what was still a medieval war. William Uncle Billy Tecumseh Sherman. I'm also going to tell you a little bit about some of his adversaries because I thought that, that you might be interesting to see who he was facing and the various things that he did. <clears throat> Sherman was a soldier, a businessman, he was an educator, and he also was an author. He was called, even in his era, the first modern general. And I'll explain later on about why he was considered to be a modern general. He was born in Ohio to a politically prominent family. Actually, he was uh, the ward of a U.S. senator. He graduated in 1840 from the military academy. In 1853, he left the service and he pursued private business. He was superintendent of the Louisiana State Seminary of Learning and Military Academy, now known as LSU. He succeeded Grant after the war as the commanding general of the Army. He served in that role for 14 more years, primarily responsible for the Army's role in the Indian Wars. He wrote his memoirs in 1875, his memoir was one of the first ones from the Civil War because he said no satisfactory history of the war had been yet available. He was not a historian, but he said any witness who disagrees with me should publish their own book. <laughs> Sherman had no political ambitions. And at the very end, I'll tell you what he had to say <clears throat> about being in politics, but he had much to say about the problems of the post-war United States. He was a man of high moral principles, but he was also surprisingly liberal for his time. Now, before the war, he was one of 11 children, and he was in the middle of that family. He was not the oldest. He was not the youngest. He was somewhere in the middle. His father died when he was, I think, 11 or 9. He became the ward of a United States senator. He went to West Point when he was 16 years old. Graduated in the class of 1840 sixth in his class out of 41. Put it mildly, he was a pretty smart guy. He served in the Second Seminole War, but he did not serve in the war with Mexico. And among the various generals in the Civil War, he was one of the very few who had not served in the Mexican War. In 1848, he was in California. He went with the governor of California <clears throat> up into the gold mining region, and they confirmed that gold had actually been discovered in the region. That inaugurated the California gold rush. He was promoted to captain in 1850, so back in that day, <clears throat> 10 years in grade as a first lieutenant and second lieutenant was not unusual. He then married his foster sister. This is the daughter of the senator for whom he was a ward. He resigned his commission in 1853, still a captain. In 1853, he then became manager of a San Francisco bank. And the little bit that I could read about his time with the bank, it was a tumultuous time. He was involved in two different shipwrecks. He actually floated through the Golden Gate on the hull of a schooner that was upside down. 
1856 during what is called the vigilante period and i couldn't find anything about that other than it was a lawless land right after the gold rush he served briefly as a major general in the california militia In 1859, he became the superintendent of that Seminary of Learning and Military Academy in Pineville, Louisiana. And I think Pineville must right, be out right outside of Baton Rouge, Jerry. You might know more about it than I do. Not someplace I know very well. He proved to be a good leader of the institution. And as I said earlier, it became LSU. In January of 1861, as states were seceding from the Union, he was directed to accept arms that had been surrendered to the militia by the arsenal at Baton Rouge. He would not do that, so he resigned his commission as a result. He went into the regular army as a colonel of the 13th Infantry Regiment. However, that regiment was one of those new regiments that was being raised at the very beginning of the war. It was not a regular army unit. His first command was that of a brigade of volunteers. He was one of the few Union officers who actually distinguished himself at first bull run. He was not happy though with what happened at Bull Run. He was very un unsettled. However, Lincoln then promoted him to Brigadier General of Volunteers. At the time, he was senior in rank to Grant. Next, he had a, a military responsibility for Kentucky. And if you all will remember, Kentucky at the time was a mess. It was uh, occupied by neither side, according to the state of Kentucky. Sherman kept requesting reinforcements. He had a very small force in being. He was, he actually had what they call a nervous breakdown or what they would call today a nervous breakdown. He felt too much responsibility and didn't have enough capability to do anything about it. He was declared unfit for duty, and he was described in the Cincinnati newspaper as being insane. So at that time, he had a lot of trouble in the Army. This is 1861. However, <clears throat> after a period of convalescence, he came back into the army. He was a, a, he was still a brigadier general, and as I said, he outranked Grant, but he provided logistical support for Grant as he captured Forts Henry and Donaldson. And as a result of that work, he was given command of the Fifth Division, which was all recruits. That division then marched south towards what we know as Shiloh. Now, here's a, here's a map that shows Shiloh. These are Forts Henry and Donaldson here. Grant's army marched down through following what amounted to <clears throat> uh, a line towards heading for Corinth. The Southern Army was in, in the Southern Army in the West was in total disarray. Albert Sidney Johnson was in, responsible for the Army, but he had them all over the place. Some were as far east as Murfreesboro, some were up in Western Kentucky. They all started retreating to come together in Corinth. Meanwhile, Grant came down this way. To Corinth or to uh, a place called Pittsburgh Landing. Shiloh is a small church near the town of Savannah, Tennessee. Grant was pursuing down this line 
what he thought of was a totally defeated and demoralized Southern army. Meanwhile, Albert Sidney Johnston, and I'm going to talk a little bit in a minute about Albert Sidney Johnston, he had collected all of the well, the forces from these disparate areas, from Murfreesboro, from Western Kentucky, even from Memphis. Bragg brought some up from the South. So he actually had a pretty substantial army at Corinth. Grant had no idea that that was who was there. Meanwhile, Grant was bringing Buell's army who were at Nashville to join him and they were going to combine to take care of what was left they thought of the Southern Army. Grant's headquarters were actually in Savannah. He was not with the army when the attack began. Albert Sidney Johnston was one of the most unusual generals in the uh, Confederate Army. He had served as a general in three different armies. First of all, he was a general in the, in the Texian Army after Texas declared independence. He then joined, rejoined the U.S. Army. He became a general in the U.S. Army. He was in command of and formed the Second Cavalry in Texas. Robert E. Lee was his second in command. And then he became a general in the Confederate Army. Johnson is the only person I know of anyway who, had, who was a general in three different armies. He graduated from West Point in 1826. He was in a lot of different combat situations. He was in the Black Hawk War, the Texas War of Independence, the Mexican-American War, the Utah War, and that actually wasn't a war. What happened was in Utah, the President of the United States told Brigham Young that they were sending in a governor for the Utah Territory. They sent in troops with this. Brigham Young chose not to fight. And then later on, the Civil War. By the time he was given command of the Western Theater, he had troops spread all over Kentucky, Tennessee, and Mississippi. And he had a very, very poor disposition at Forts Henry and Donaldson. But he was responsible. And, and, and the, if you read about, in particular, Fort Henry, he was responsible for those forts. He told them to hold their, hold their position. Grant surrounded them and captured them. So Johnston was badly, badly represented in the press as having lost those forts. <clears throat> he was considered by Jefferson Davis to be the finest general officer in the Confederacy before the emergence of Robert Lee. Johnston was killed at Shiloh the first day of Shiloh leading a charge against the hornet's nest. He actually, as a full general officer, was leading the charge of about a battalion against the hornet's nest. He was shot in the leg, did not know, did not have any idea of how serious his wound was, and he bled to death. George, do you remember, was, was he hit by friendly fire or? No. Or? No, he was leading the charge against the hornet's nest. He wasn't, it wasn't, uh, he was where he shouldn't have been, and he knew he was where he shouldn't have been. He was the highest ranking officer killed during the entire war. Davis later on said that the loss of General Johnson was the turning point of our fate. Now, where was Sherman? <clears throat> at Shiloh. Grant set up camp over here in an area west of a place called Pittsburgh Landing. Pittsburgh Landing was where the ships coming down or up the Tennessee River would, would uh, debark. 
That's where cotton was brought to these ships that would be sent up the Tennessee or down the Tennessee actually to market. Grant brought this army, as I showed you on the bigger overview, down this area. He set them up along this line here. They did not fortify their positions. They considered that, that Johnston was back in Corinth. Johnston was in disarray. Grant totally underestimated what was going to happen. Sherman's division did not set up a strong position. They got some early warning because there was some firing going on out in this area, mostly from pickets. So as the Southern Army was approaching, there was some indication that they were there, but even Sherman himself said, <clears throat> there's nobody out there, you don't need to worry about it. So when they struck, they were taken by surprise. His division, which is here on the right flank of the Union Army, was almost overrun. However, he managed to withdraw in a fairly orderly fashion. They fought for every yard that they surrendered. They, back, they were back, backing up. If you look over here, you can see how far in the second map <clears throat> by the afternoon, you could see they were back along a line like this, there were a large number of <clears throat> people who had just run. They were hiding underneath the cliffs here. The Union Army was in pretty serious situation by, by early afternoon. However, Johnston was killed early in the afternoon. Beauregard took over. Beauregard, the, the original plan was to go around the left flank of the Union Army, to go this way, cut them off from their retreat, surround them and annihilate them. Beauregard did not really know what Johnston was planning. Beauregard was his second in command, but he really didn't understand what the battle plan was. He continued the assaults along the line here, Throughout the day, Sherman demonstrated that in combat, he was cool-headed. He had two horses shot out from under him. He, was, he had several different bullet holes in his uniform, and he just never lost his cool. His control of the situation saved the right flank of the army, and he saved because of that, he saved Grant's army that day. Now, by the end of the first day, Grant by now was on the field. Grant was very, very discombobulated by what had happened. Sherman told him not to worry, that come the second day, everything would be better. So Sherman actually cooled Grant down. Grant was in pretty serious condition late that first day. Sherman and Grant became the best of friends through all of this. Shiloh the second day. Overnight, the situation changed. Buell got here from Nashville. Johnston was dead. Beauregard was overwhelmed and they started to withdraw. By then there were two Northern soldiers on the field for every one Southern soldier left in combat capability. Sherman's performance of the battle was praised by both Grant and Halleck. Remember Halleck at the time was still in charge of the Union Army in the West. And after the battle, Sherman was promoted to Major General of Volunteers. This was the first major battle of the war. There were 23,000 casualties at Shiloh. And it was clear to both Sherman and Grant, this war was not going to be over 
in three months, six months, or nine months. They were in, they both realized they were in the war for the long haul. Vicksburg came next. Vicksburg was the link between the Eastern Confederate States and the Western ones. There were other places that you could get across the Mississippi River. The other main fortification was Port Hudson, but Vicksburg was the link. That was the place where the railroad came to. So if you could go, if you wanted to transport material, anything you wanted to transport east-west, Vicksburg was the place to do that. In the space of a little bit over nine months, Grant launched six separate efforts to capture Vicksburg. And if you read about Grant's campaigns to capture Vicksburg, it is textbook. He tried just about everything that you can think of to go around. Some of the time he came down the western bank, some of the time he came down the eastern bank, but the terrain in, in particular in here was so unfriendly to an army on the march that Vicksburg withstood the first five efforts. The other factor was <clears throat> Vicksburg was not getting the attention that it merited because of the focus on Virginia. Joseph Johnson was in charge now of, of the army in the West in the Confederacy. He asked for reinforcements to come from Virginia. Virginia had just finished the second battle of Bull Run, the battle of Chancellorsville. The Union army was in disarray in Virginia. Even I think as, as Jerry said last time, Longstreet wanted to bring his corps to Vicksburg to relieve it. However, Robert Lee said, I think what we should do is we should go into the north. He did go into the north. They did not send the troops to the west. Gettysburg followed in the east. And you know what happened at Vicksburg. The, the citadel itself was commanded by a general named Pemberton. Pemberton was a Pennsylvanian. Tell you a little bit about him. He was a career army officer in both the Seminole Wars and the Mexican-American War. He grew up in Pennsylvania, graduated from West Point in 1837, 27th in his class of 50. He was a classmate of George Gordon Mee, of Hooker, and Braxton Bragg. All these guys knew each other, they knew who each other were, they studied the same things, they followed the same tactics. It's just amazing that all of these various military academy graduates were what led both the South and the North in the Civil War. He served as a Confederate Lieutenant General during the war. He led what was called the Army of Mississippi, which was a beaten, demoralized army and a garrison army as opposed to a field army from December of 62 to July of 63. He was defeated first <clears throat> by Grant and Sherman at a battle called Champion Hill. Champion Hill is east of Vicksburg. Once Grant was ashore, he first captured Jackson, Mississippi, and then he came west. He met Pemberton at Champion Hill. They defeated the Confederates at, at Champion Hill. He was then the commanding officer of the surrender at Vicksburg. Now, before I get to his feud with Johnston, after he surrendered at Vicksburg, I think I've talked a little bit earlier about the fact that all of the Southern forces at Vicksburg were paroled. Part of the parole was they were not to fight again. 
Pemberton was one of those who did then return to the Confederate Army, spent the rest of the war in, in various positions in the East, was not a factor in the war, but he continued to fight against the North. In theory, had he ever been captured, he would have been hung. After the war, he feuded with Johnston. And the reason he feuded with Johnston was he said Johnston was supposed to come to his relief at Vicksburg. Johnston said, I didn't have the forces to come anywhere into contact with, with Grant. He died. He, Pemberton, then returned to Pennsylvania after the war. And that's where he died. And there was a great deal of argument about where he was going to be buried, how he was going to be buried, because the people in Pennsylvania weren't real happy that he was a Confederate general. Now, back to Sherman at Vicksburg. After Shiloh, briefly, he was the military governor of Memphis, and I'm not sure what that role entailed. However, <clears throat> during the Vicksburg campaign, and remember I said there were six different campaigns. By now, Sherman was a corps commander during the entire campaign. The first thing his corps did was they came down the river to a place called Chickasaw Bayou. And I believe that's about right in here. It was a swamp north of the Yazoo River. Sherman's corps was defeated in that battle. That's how that campaign came to an end. So his first experience at Vicksburg was a defeat. Later in the campaign, <clears throat> his corps then became part of the capture of a place called Arkansas Post that's up the Arkansas River. And I believe the Arkansas River is this river here. Anyway, there was a post up there that had about 5,000 troops, Confederate troops. They captured it, but it really had no effect one way or the other on the battle. Then what happened was Grant came down the west bank of the Mississippi, came around Vicksburg. They brought ships by Vicksburg. They ran what they call the gauntlet. These were troop ships, empty troop ships, brought the troop ships down here to. Uh, pick up Grant's army. Grant's army then moved inland, came up to Jackson, all the way over here to Jackson, and then back to Vicksburg, totally without logistical support. Sherman's Corps was an integral part of that, that operation. Throughout that whole campaign, he provided both physical and psychological support for Grant, helping him. And at times, I think Grant was ready to give up. Supposedly, he had periods when he was drinking, and he and he and Sherman formed the team that they formed at that time. Sherman's next opportunity was Chattanooga. It became the center of attention after Vicksburg. Bragg, who was in Chattanooga, had gone north, had all the way got, gotten all the way up into Perryville, Kentucky. He won a tactical victory at a place called Perryville, however, chose not to stay in Kentucky because he had no, cap no capability to support himself. He withdrew to Stones River. He was defeated at Stones River by uh, up here around Murfreesboro. He was defeated by the uh, Union Army. He started withdrawing. He was actually outmaneuvered throughout Middle Tennessee all the way down to Chattanooga. Rosecrans was then maneuvering to capture Chattanooga when Bragg, and actually had occupied had Chattanooga when Bragg defeated him at Chickamauga. Rosecrans then retreated back into Chattanooga and he was besieged by Bragg and the Southern Army. 
talked about that in another talk. What did the Union Army do? First thing they did was they moved Grant into Chattanooga. As soon as Grant moved into Chattanooga, he fired Rosecrans and gave Thomas command of the Army of the Cumberland. Now, what did Sherman do at Chattanooga? By now, <clears throat> Sherman was an Army commander. He was in command of what was called the Army of Tennessee. With the Army of the Cumberland besieged in Chattanooga, the Union <clears throat> forces were reinforced both from the east and from the west. From the east came Hooker with a corps from the Army of the Potomac, and from the west came Sherman with the Army of Tennessee. Sherman brought three corps from the Vicksburg Theater to help relieve the city of Chattanooga. Once they were in Chattanooga, <clears throat> Grant was now ready to take the offensive. So what Sherman did, and you have to <clears throat> pay a little bit of attention to the terrain. Sherman was on the north bank of the Tennessee River and marched here behind the ridge all the way up to North Chickamauga Creek. So he marched behind Stringer's Ridge with something on the order of 25,000 men, crossed the Tennessee River. He was planning to assault the northern flank of the Missionary Ridge. However, instead what he assaulted was Billy, Gro Billy Goat Hill. Found that there was nobody up there. And by the time he got himself reoriented, he then assaulted the northern flank but he was unable to dislodge the Southern Army <clears throat> from the northern edge of the ridge until Thomas's grand assault across the front of Missionary Ridge broke the Southern lines. And then they followed Thomas's assault going after the retreat of Bragg's army. Hey, George? Yes. Uh, you kept on saying that uh, they crossed the Tennessee River. I mean. How did they do it with 25,000 men? They built a pontoon bridge. Okay. They, it was, I've, I've said before, the Tennessee River at that time of the year was not the Tennessee River you see today. It was a much, much, unless it was in flood, there were areas where it was very, very, you could walk across it almost. I okay. don't know if at that area it was that shallow, but it was not hard to get across. Okay. <clears throat> After Chattanooga, Grant was now elevated to command of all Union forces, and Sherman was made commander of all troops in the Western Theater. So now Sherman was in charge of all Union forces west of the Allegheny. His next adversary was Joseph E. Johnston. He was in the army during the Mexican-American War and the Seminole Wars. By 1860, now he had been in the army, in the U.S. Army for more than 30 years. He was a brigadier general he was the quartermaster general of the U.S. Army. He was actually the ranking general in the Army other than Albert Sidney Johnson had date of rank on him, but he didn't have nearly the kind of responsibility that Joseph Johnson had. And by the way, they were not related at all. After Virginia seceded, he joined the Confederate States as one of its senior general officers. And there was an ongoing dispute in the South about who had data rank over who. And Johnston never really got along with Davis because Davis did not treat him as he considered it with degree of gravity that he thought that he deserved because he was 
the only general from the regular army to come into the Confederacy. George, one little question. All these generals graduated from West Point. How many generals were there against each other as far as the North and the South? And it seemed like they all graduated from West Point. The, 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 the details that I've heard were of the 55 major battles in the Civil War, the West Pointer <clears throat> led at least one of the sides in every single one of them, and in most of them led both sides. I'm not yeah, sure. I was, just, I was just wondering, George, how many generals were for the North and how many were for the South? And they, you know, here they are, they, they were in the, at West Point, they knew each other and they fought each other. By and large, they treated each other. It, like I said, this was a medieval war. This was not total war. They did not hate each other. They did not treat each other. If, if one of them defeated the other one, they were courteous about it. They treated each other with respect. It was a gentleman's war. We don't necessarily think of it that way. And certainly an awful lot of people were being hurt in that gentleman's war, but the generals treated each other very, very cavalierly. Hey, you. George, if I can interject. Sure. Uh, there were 294 generals that graduated from West Point. Uh, 151 fought for the Confederacy. Or excuse me, the total was 445 generals from West Point. 294 for Union, 151 fought, fought for the Confederacy. Thank you, Jerry. If you were a military academy graduate and you were over three or four years out of the academy during the Civil War, you were probably a general. There might have been a few who weren't, but most of them were. Joseph Johnson then commanded what was called the Army of Tennessee against Sherman in the Atlanta campaign. Remember now, Grant left, went east, stayed east with the Army of the Potomac, and Sherman remained in the west to go after the Southern Army. At the end of the war, <clears throat> Johnston did not stay in command of the Army of Tennessee throughout the entire Atlanta campaign. He was relieved by John Bell Hood, and I'm going to talk about John Bell Hood in a little while. Outside of Atlanta, Hood remained in charge of the Army of Tennessee through the Battle of Franklin and Nashville, at which time Hood was relieved and Johnson was put back in charge of the Army of Tennessee, what was left of it. That was Johnson's last command in the Carolinas campaign. I'm gonna to get to the Carolinas campaign in a little while. Johnston was a pallbearer at Sherman's funeral. And you've probably heard this story at Sherman's funeral. It was a raining, sleeting, bitterly cold day. Johnson chose not to wear a hat out of deference to Sherman and his funeral, caught pneumonia and died. All right, now back to Sherman, heading south. This is May through July of 1864. They were coming this way. The blue is Sherman's, actually he was divided. He had about a hundred plus thousand men. Joseph Johnson is the red. Retrograde movements is the term for this retreat. Grant went to Virginia, Sherman moved towards Atlanta. Bragg, who had been at Chattanooga, was replaced by Joseph Johnston, who I just talked about. Sherman had, like I said, 100,000 men. Johnston had less than 80. They fought a series of small battles. First at Dalton, then at Resaca, then at Adairsville. And every time Johnston would build a defensive position, Sherman would go around it. 
However, when they got to Kennesaw Mountain, which is right outside of Atlanta, for whatever reasons, Sherman decided to try a frontal assault. Kennesaw Mountain was probably Sherman's largest defeat in the entire war. He, if, you, if you've ever been up Kennesaw Mountain, I've been up to that battlefield. Coming up the, that hill towards the people dug in on the side was not a pretty sight. Primarily through these flanking maneuvers, the Army gradually moved south. In July, Jefferson Davis had had it with Joseph Johnston. He replaced Joseph Johnston with John Bell Hood. I'm going to tell you a little bit about John Bell Hood. Very, very interesting character. He was a Confederate general with a reputation for bravery, but aggressiveness that bordered on recklessness. He graduated from West Point in 1853. 44th in the class of 52. He was almost expelled his final year for excessive demerits. I wouldn't know about that kind of demerit total. I never had anything like that. At Gettysburg, he was, I believe, in, uh, he was a, a, a division commander at Gettysburg. He was in the he was in the assault around either the devil's I think the devil's den. He was severely wounded, and his left arm was useless for the rest of his life. He he came with Longstreet to Chickamauga, so the remember part of the Army of Northern Virginia came across the uh, southern United States. And he led the assault at Chickamauga. He led that assault that came across and, and through the gap in the Union line. However, he was wounded again, and this time he lost his right leg. So now he has one leg missing and a useless left arm. He went, he became convalescent after Chickamauga, and for the better part of a year. He was in convalescence. He came back into the Army. At the age of 33, he was promoted to being a full general and given command of the Army of Tennessee in Atlanta. He was the youngest Army commander in the entire war. He died in Louisiana in 1879 of scarlet fever, so he died young he was 48 years old both he and his wife this was in new orleans both he and his wife had scarlet fever and died uh, i think it was yellow fever and died left 11 children orphans that's john bell hood now i want to talk about the battles of atlanta and sherman and hood <coughs> After Johnston was relieved, Sherman now invested Atlanta. He did not have it totally surrounded. These two railroads for some time were still in service and able to bring supplies into Hood. But however, Hood decided, having heard about what happened at, at Vicksburg, having heard about other places that had been surrounded, he said, I am not gonna stay in Atlanta and let you sap my strength. He became aggressive and took the initiative. In July, he launched major attacks at Peachtree Creek, the Battle of Atlanta, which is right in here, and the Battle of Ezra Church. All of these were actually southern attacks. In each attack, he was severely repulsed. He kept losing more men than he was able to do without. In August, he attacked again at Lovejoy Station and at Jonesboro, down here. 
This is when <clears throat> the Union Army was going to cut his last railroad. He was defeated at both of these. Hood was the kind of person that beat me now, you get to beat me again tomorrow, beat me tomorrow, you get to fight me again the next day. But after the last defeat at Jonesboro, Hood evacuated Atlanta. And where he, what he did was he took his army this way and headed west. He headed away from Savannah. On the 15th of November, Sherman ordered the military munitions factories and everything else be burned. Next came the march to the sea. As I said, Hood moved west, Sherman went east. He sent Thomas with the Army of the Cumberland to tend to Hood. So the Army of the Cumberland went back this way as Sherman went that way. He was determined to destroy the Confederacy's capacity to wage war. It was not to kill civilians, but it was to destroy property and infrastructure that the March to the Sea took place. Both Lincoln and Grant had reservations about his plans. His 62,000 men army were split into two columns and they lived off the land. There was no one to stop him. If you read about the march to the sea, half their time was spent foraging for food. In six weeks, Savannah fell without a fight. In December of 64, Hood's Army of Tennessee was destroyed by Schofield and Thomas at Franklin and Nashville. That was the army that Johnston then took recommand of and moved into the Carolinas, what was left of it. In January of 65, he turned north and he advanced up through the Carolinas. His intention was to link up with Grant up in Virginia, up in here. In February, Columbia surrendered to Sherman and the city was destroyed. And there's a great deal of dis disagreement about whose fault it was that the city was burned. In the process, he defeated Joseph E. Johnston's army at the Battle of Bentonville in March of 65. Johnston surrendered on April 26, 1865. That ended the Civil War. What did Sherman do after the war? His first post-war command was the military division of the Missouri, everything between the Mississippi River and the Rocky Mountain. He was focused on protecting the main wagon roads, such as the Oregon, Bozeman, and Santa Fe trails. However, another main concern was the construction and operation of the railroads protecting it from attack by hostile Indians. After the Fetterman Massacre in 1866, I want to tell you a little bit about the Fetterman Massacre. He wrote, Grant, we must act with vindictive earnestness against the Sioux, even if to their extermination, men, women, and children. He considered the fight with the Native Americans total war. However, there was little large-scale military action taken against the Indians during those three years of his tenure. Fetterman Massacre it was a battle of between in Red Cloud's War in 1866 between a confederation of Indian tribes and a detachment of the army whose mission was intended to protect travelers on the Bozeman Trail. A group of 10 warriors lured a detachment of soldiers into an ambush. All 81 men under the command of William Fetterman were killed by the Native Americans. At the time, it was the worst military disaster ever suffered by the U.S. Army on the Great Plains. As you well know, it was subsequently outdone by George Custer at the Little Bighorn. The remaining U.S. forces withdrew from that area. When Grant became president, Sherman was then promoted to general of the army, commanding general of the entire United States Army. 
Much of his time was devoted to making the Western and Plains states safe for settlement. Three different Indian wars, one of which was the Sioux War of 1876, which included the Little Bighorn. After Little Bighorn, Sherman wrote, hostile savages like Sit and Bull must feel the power of the government. He further wrote that during any assault, a soldier cannot pause to distinguish between male, female, or age. Sherman died of pneumonia in New York City in 1891, and I told you about his funeral where Joseph E. Johnston was a pallbearer. Now, I tried to think of how to frame Sherman's legacy. And what I did was chose some of his words. These are all quotes. In our country, one class of men makes war, but leaves another to fight it out. I would make this war as severe as possible and show no symptoms of tiring until the South begs for mercy. I intend to make Georgia howl. If nominated, this is his attitude about political life. He is the first one to have said these words. If nominated, I will not run. If elected, I will not serve. If I have to choose between the penitentiary and the White House, I would say the penitentiary, thank you. War is cruelty. There is no use trying to reform it. The crueler it is, the sooner it will be over. War is at its best barbarism. If I had my choice, I would kill every reporter in the world, but I am sure we would then be getting reports from hell before breakfast. So that is William Tecumseh Sherman. Questions? George, uh, about the press. I mean, he he, the press. There's quite a few people who, who hate the press these days. It's true. <laughs> Nixon hated the press. Trump hates the press. <laughs> yep, hey, Trump hates the press. Hey, George, after the Civil War, how... Uh, were there very many instances where Union officers and Confederate officers actually came together? Oh, uh, sure. They had reunions at Gettysburg all the way up until the middle of the early part, at least, of the 20th century. Did you, do you know if they had reunions at West Point to bring them together? You know, that's a good question. I suspect that they did, but I've never read about any. We, we, we have a reunion every five years. Yeah, I don't think that's a modern. With so many that fought in the Civil War, I, I, I think they, they probably got together pretty, pretty regular or something. Yes, I think so. They, especially on the battlefields, especially on the anniversaries of, say, 10, 20, 30. Gettysburg was having reunions all the way up until the 1920s, I think. Hey George, yeah, uh, maybe you could film. There was there was a, a a thing they did. They did part a lot of pardons. I think in the Civil War, where they would have they would they would have a battle, and people would be captured, and there was some kind of arrangement where you could be issued a pardon. Yeah. You give up your gun and you'd walk home, and you'd promise not to fight again. How did that? Work? They call them paroles. Paroles, okay. And how did that work? <laughs> well, I, uh, the best the best example was uh, a general named Stevenson. If you ever seen have been up on Lookout Mountain and saw the the plaques to Stevenson's brigade, probably. Stevenson was one of the brigade commanders at Vicksburg. His entire brigade was captured. They were all paroled. Then they all came with the army 
to Chattanooga with Bragg's army. They were on Lookout Mountain. <coughs> and one of their major fears was that if they got captured up there, they would have been hung. Oh, if you violated the parole, you mean? That's correct. Okay. I've so that, never heard of anybody they actually did that to. But that was the story anyway. Well, it was basically your word of honor that you wouldn't re-engage in the war once you were paroled, right? That's correct. But it was a legal document. It wasn't just your word of honor. You were legally paroled by the United States government. Yeah, they had to sign that paper. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, George, great program. Thank you so much. Very Thank good. you, George. That was very good. See you guys tomorrow morning. Right. Okay. I yeah, just George, I know what the answer is, right? How's that?